Okay, so we continue this morning session. It is a pleasure to introduce Vicente Cortez from Hamburg University, who is going to speak about generalized instance structures on Linux. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be in Madrid. And uh, so, as um, Mario, Mario said, I will speak about the generalized instance structures uh, on uh, Lee groups. And so, my plan is first to give a general uh, description uh, of left invariant. Uh, metrics and left invariant generalized Einstein metrics uh, on uh, E groups, and then in the second part to discuss our uh, classification in three dimensions. So it sounds a bit small, dimension three, but we uh, classify all uh, really all possibilities, so all signatures of the metrics, all possible choices of divergence, as we will see. So I will explain this uh, step by step. Okay, so. Uh, I start by um, explaining what is a Kuhan algebraoid and so to situate you in the, in the correct, correct uh, setting. So, Kuhan algebraoid is a formalization of some structure which we have on the, tan on the sum of the tangent and the cotangent bundle of a manifold. It is a um, vector bundle, has a certain uh, bracket on, the, on its sections. Uh, which is as canonical as the Lie bracket of uh, vector fields, but has uh, slightly different uh, properties. So I will uh, recall this uh, very briefly. So the main um, data are the vector bundle uh, over some smooth manifold uh, M. And then we have an anchor map. This is a homomorphism of vector bundles from E to TM. So we have a relation between the abstract vector bundle E and the tangent. Uh, bundle and there's also a scalar product and fiber wise uh, on the fibers of the vector bundle E and the uh, signature is neutral in our setting of the scalar product and finally the most important part is the bracket uh, which is called the Dorfman bracket I will label it here at the moment with E here to distinguish it from the Lie bracket so this goes from uh, this maps uh, pairs of sections of E uh, again to a section of E. And uh, there are uh, axioms. In fact, there are uh, three axioms. So it's not very difficult to remember the uh, definition of a quant algebra. It has many properties, but they follow on these axioms. So the first axiom is just the Jacobi identity. So if you write it in the following way, it's just a familiar identity. Copy identity tells you that the bracket with an element is a derivation for the bracket. So this is the same uh, here. So we have here bracket U, uh, B, W, plus U, so plus B bracket of U with W. Is the first uh, axiom. Then the second axiom is the compatibility um, of the bracket with the scalar product. So it's also easy uh, to remember. So you can uh, differentiate the scalar product of two vectors, E and W, so two sections of E in direction uh, of a section U. And by this, I mean that you apply first pi to U, this gives a vector field, and then you differentiate in direction of the vector field. But I will not use pi here in the notation to simplify a bit the notation. And the, the formula is that this is computed using the bracket. So it's uv w plus w scalar product. And uh, funny enough, there's a second identity which permits to calculate exa exactly the same uh, quantity. And this is related to the deviation of this uh, bracket to be a Lie bracket. And the, pro the problem is that this bracket is not skew-symmetric. So even if we have the, this Jacobi identity, we cannot say that it defines a Lie bracket. In fact, there's a symmetric uh, part in, in this bracket. And this is also um, computed by a similar relation here, this axiom C1, which is the scalar product of U with the symmetric part of the bracket times the symmetric part of the bracket. Okay, that's all. So just these three uh, axioms, and then it can be checked by some calculations that they in, imply several nice properties which you would like 
to have, namely that this uh, anchor map is the homomorphism of a bracket. So if you take pi of a bracket UB, then you get exactly the Lie bracket of the corresponding vector fields. And also you have a Leibniz um, rule Namely, when you take the bracket of u with f times v, where f is a function, um, this uh, satisfies the Leibniz rule. And remember that u x is pi of u on the function. OK, so this is the, the, the general definition. And we will be interested in um, exact here because we will work on the tangent bundle, uh, generalized tangent bundle of a Lie group. So, um, what is an exact uh, current algebra? So, so exact. Yeah, I think I should put this one. Record. This is uh, well known, and I'm just reviewing it uh, quickly. So um, we have this anchor map from uh, E to the tangent bundle of the manifold, and you can also consider a dual uh, map of uh, pi. This will go from T star M to E star, but the E star uh, is identified with E using the scalar product. And so we can write this sequence here and ask, ask uh, for the sequence to be exact. So if this is exact, uh, then we call the Kuhn algebra exact. Exact with all these uh, structures, of course, on it. And this sequence is exact. And it's uh, known, uh, I think it's a result due to Pavel uh, Severa, that uh, all exact uh, current algebras can be obtained as follows up to isomorphism of uh, current algebras. Uh, so you, you, you have the vector bundle E, which is just the so called generalized tangent bundle, which is the sum of uh, Tm plus T star M. So up to isomorphism, it will be this. And uh, the bracket. Okay, so first of all, what is the anchor? The anchor is the obvious projection to Tm. Uh, the scalar product is the obvious scalar product obtained uh, here from the pairing. I can write it here as x plus psi, y plus eta, where, where x, y are vector fields and psi, eta, one forms. This is one half uh, psi of y plus eta of x. So this is the scalar product. And uh, the bracket is the most interesting part, and this is completely determined by a closed freeform H. So now I change a little bit the notation. I put now as a label. This is a closed uh, freeform. And uh, there's an explicit uh, formula for the bracket. Okay, so I can write it. <clears throat> So you use the uh, Lie derivative direction of the vector field x to act on y plus uh, theta. Uh, and then you have minus the interior product of y with a d psi. And there's a third term which involves this, uh, this um, three form, this is h, x, y dot. So this again, one form is also one form, and this is a vector field. So one can check that this satisfies all the axioms. In some sense, it's a prototypical uh, example, and it's called the H-twisted generalized tangent bundle. And we will be interested in the case of a, a Lie uh, group. So we we'll consider this H-twisted generalized tangent bundles of Lie groups. So this is a special case of the above. And the only um, thing which I want in addition is that everything should be left invariant. So this makes sense because uh, the group acts, of course, on the tangent bundle, on the cotangent bundle, and I can ask for the bracket to be 
uh, left invariant in this amount to asking the disclosed uh, three forms left invariant. The main point is that H should be left invariant. And so for such a left invariant, one form can be identified uh, with, an, with a tensor on the Lie algebra. It's an, ele it's an element of uh, wedge three, G star, which is the algebra of the group. And by the way, also this bracket uh, is a tensor, it's now a tensor, can be considered as a tensor on the Lie algebra. It's not, uh, it was not assumed to be tensorial, but if we restrict it to left invariant uh, sections, then it, it's just encoded in the tensor on the Lie algebra. So we have this bracket, uh, which will go from, in fact, now I introduce a vector space. P e of G is just finite dimensional vector space G plus uh, G star. And uh, I can call it just E. And now uh, this bracket goes from E times E to E. So it's a real uh, bilinear form with some properties which mimic the general uh, properties, so no problem uh, to write them. And uh, in fact, the formula is explicit. Uh, you can write this formula just using data on the D algebra. So the Lie derivative uh, on the vector will be just a bracket, E bracket, Lie derivative on the one form is a quadrant representation. The D is just a Durham differential restricted to left invariant forms, which is the chevalier eilenberg complex, and uh, H is a left invariant one form. So everything will be left invariant if we use this um, formula. And that's exactly the setting in which we want to uh, work. Uh, okay, and so now uh, I should start to speak about a generalized pseudo Riemannian matrix, which will be the main uh, object. And I will first explain this in general and then uh, specialize to a Lie group, a Lie group uh, setting. So generalized Riemannian. Um, Matrix. Give a definition uh, on, uh, yeah, so we are restricted from now on to this general standing bundle of the manifold, H twisted. So a generalized low Riemannian metric. Uh, is a is a section so I will denote it as calligraphic G uh, to be distinguished from Gothic uh, G, which is the D algebra, so this calligraphic G. So this is a section of the symmetric square of the generalized uh, cotangent bundle uh, of the manifold. But plays the role of a, of a metric, only that instead of the tangent bundle, we have the generalized uh, tangent bundle, but of course, it has to satisfy some uh, properties. It should be non, non degenerate. And this will follow from the axioms which I will write properties. In fact, I, we want that um, the restriction of this G to the cotangent bundle, the ordinary <coughs> uh, cotangent bundle, uh, should be non degenerate. So, this is an extra assumption which is automatic if it is positive definite. And this is automatic, but here we assume it degenerate. And uh, second, um, when we consider the endomorphism defined by this um, section together with the scalar product. We we'll call this G end defined by a G equal scalar product G end dot dot. So it's just a, if you like the quotient of scalar product and uh, G metric G. This is an endomorphism uh, of the generalized tangent bundle, and this endomorphism should be an involution. This volatile 
so this is the involution, the involution the square to uh, identity and this implies that then you can decompose it into eigenspaces and on these eigenspaces for the eigenvalue plus one and minus one uh, the metric g will differ from the scalar product just by a sign so i'm going to splitting into some subspace uh, t the sub bundle t and plus and the sub bundle t and minus which I've generalized quantum bundle uh, this is orthogonal with respect to both uh, metrics and on the plus part the metrics coincide on the minus part they differ by a uh, minus sign. So this is this is exactly the setting we will uh, consider. And uh, on the Lie group again, we ask that this is a left invariant, uh, and then it reduces again to some structure on the Lie algebra. If uh, M is a Lie group, and um, G is left invariant. Then G reduces to what we call a um, pseudo Riemannian, a generalized pseudo Riemannian metric on the Lie algebra. This is generalized pseudo Riemannian metric on the algebra. And uh, yeah, this is defined exactly in the same way. So a condition will be instead of this um, generalized uh, tangent bundle, you will work with this uh, vector space G plus G star. If I call it E or G. And then you have a symmetric bilinear form on this vector space, uh, which is non-degenerate when restricted to G star. And such that the corresponding endomorphism when you compare the standard scalar product with uh, with this G uh, squares to, to uh, one. So this is the definition of a pseudo Riemannian metric on the Lie algebra. And we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between um, pseudo Riemannian generalized metrics on Lie groups and pseudo Riemannian <coughs> generalized metrics on uh, Lie algebras. Okay, and, but um, for defining the uh, <coughs> Ricci uh, curvature and considering the Einstein equations, we need also connection, generalization of the notion of a connection. This is what I want to explain uh, next. But I think before I do that, I uh, would like to state some general fact, uh, which is useful, which reduces the study of the general case of a left invariant um, generalized pseudo Riemannian metric to a particular uh, type of such metrics. Uh, so we can bring them, them in some sense to a normal form. Position G H G. We can call this a pseudo Riemannian Lie group. So it's a, a generalized pseudo Riemannian Lie group. So we have a current exact current algebra structure on the generalized tangent bundle of G and this metric. Generalized to the Riemannian Lie group. group. And then uh, this, this is isomorphic. Um, it is isomorphic to another generalized to the Riemannian Lie group of the following type. The form. So G is the same same group. We don't change the group, but we change the three form. So we allow uh, to change the three form. In fact, by changing the representative in the cohomology class of the three form, and um, the, this uh, can be done in such a way that here we obtain a very particular type of generalized metric. So we are H prime belongs to the homology class of H, and um, G G is of the form. Yeah, we can write. 
could write a, a section of the generalized time command as x plus xi. Y plus well, and, and this can be written as one half xy plus g inverse psi uh, eta. So this is it has block diagonal form if, if you like. G inverse with respect to the splitting into tangent bundle and uh, cotangent uh, bundle. And this is in fact up to isomorphism in the most general form. So this means we don't need to consider. Uh, up to paying the price that we change the three form, we can uh, bring it to this particular form. And our, our calculations will, will be all in this particular form. I mean, the classification then of the of, um, solutions of the Einstein equations will be in this particular uh, form. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, is the metric uh, little g uh, fixed uh, before? Uh, or? No, g is. Uh, thank you very much for the question. So where g, which is this, this is this, and uh, g is a pseudo Riemann left invariant pseudo Riemannian metric on the Lie group g. Left invariant, an ordinary pseudo Riemannian metric. On so the result says that such there a exists, exists. Yes, so the result is that uh, there exists a um, representative H prime and the pseudo Riemannian metric uh, G uh, such that uh, G H G is isomorphic to this G H prime G G. That's the claim. Do you get a two form as well? The yeah, so the, the two form will appear when you write the isomorphism. Then you have a B field transformation which will uh, interchange, which will map one to the other, and there will be a two form there. In general, of course, a uh, uh, closed uh, three form on a Lie algebra uh, is not necessarily exact. So this depends on the Lie <coughs> algebra cohomology if you want to, if it is exact in the, in the class of this left invariant setting. This can be decided uh, looking at the cohomology. Okay, but the main point for us is that we don't need to consider the general, most general form of metrics. It is sufficient to consider these type of metrics, generalized metrics. Okay, then I think probably it's five or so uh, will be about the uh, uh, curvature. I, no, okay, I think first probably about maybe Chivita generalized connections. Can I ask a question? Yeah, so please. Is is there so can this always be done locally? Like for any general yes. you Riemannian metric you can always do this yes. locally. I mean, yes. is, there, is it known what the instruction is to doing it? Uh, no, th th this is um uh yeah, th so th this uh, result uh, exists uh, even without the left invariant uh, setting. You can do this always uh, locally, but globally you may not uh, obtain this uh, global isomorphism. Mm -hmm. So this is some topological. You're speaking P star yeah. and looking at the orthogonal complement. But P star is isotropic always. Yes. So, so you just look at the orthogonal complement to get a splitting, right? Yes. And that's the one you're using to get the metric. That's all. So it's a yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so this is a um, uh, an effect which we formulate here for the left invariant setting, in, which is uh, very, very uh, useful. So. I think now next thing is to talk about the Levi Civita generalized connections. I mean, the upshot is here simply that to study such a generalized to the Riemannian matrix on the D group, left invariant ones, is sufficient to consider ordinary left invariant to the Riemannian metric together with the closed left invariant. Uh, uh, three form and of course the Lie group structure on the group G. That's all. Uh, okay, and now to define curvature, I need the uh, Levi Civita generalized um, connection. And there's a, there's a general theory which was developed in particular by uh, Mario Fernandez, Fernandez. And so I will review uh, some of this, which we then apply in the left invariant uh, setting, and then it further uh, simplifies. So, um, first of all, what is a generalized uh, connection? So generalized connection um, is an operator uh, D 
from okay from sections of um, you know standard bundle times sections of you know standard bundle again sections of the generalized quantum bundle uh, which so you can denote it as uh, u v maps to e u v and it has some nice uh, properties so it satisfies I will not write them because I see that my time is a little bit, um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, using up too much time. So we have a Leibniz rule in uh, V, of course it's the uncut Leibniz rule, and uh, we have um, linearity over the uh, functions in the variable uh, U. And uh, so this, this defines uh, generalized uh, connections. Uh, and uh, the third property, um, so this would be, an, uh, you could call, um, Okay, some calligraphic or this um, Bobaki TM connection, uh, you could call, um, call this uh, in that way, if it satisfies the Leibniz rule in B, uncut Leibniz rule, and it is uh, uh, linear of the functions in the variable U, U. But we have an additional condition, namely that it is metric with respect to a scalar product. So if you compute U, B, um, W, I'm, I'm just speaking about uh, here a generalized uh, connection. Generalized connection. I'm not yet speaking about Levi Civita. Just a generalized connection. So it has these properties which I have mentioned. And in addition, we have uh, this property which is familiar from working with uh, metric connections. But now uh, we have just a scalar product. It's not, it does not yet involve the generalized metric. sections of the generalized standard bundle we have this uh, property this is uh, called um, generalized uh, connection d and uh, to, call, to call it the levi civita connection it should be torsion free and metric so it's called metric uh, if the generalized metric is coherently constant to define this you have first to extend this operator d to tensors uh, over the generalized standard bundle which can be done in the same way as one ordinary connection, no problem. And then you can write this condition. And uh, the other mm, condition is that the torsion is zero. And for this, you need to define the torsion. The torsion um, is defined uh, by a formula which looks similar to the usual formula, but it's not quite the same. So here, instead of the Lee bracket, you use now this uh, current bracket, but if you do this, then it turns out that it's not tensorial and it's not a good idea to do it. But you can add here a du a star applied to V, where star stands for the metric adjoint with respect to the scalar product. Um, okay, this is the formula for the torsion. And uh, the generalized connection is called Levi Civita. Generalized connection if it is metric and torsion free. And, and uh, the difference to the usual case is that although such um, Levi Civita connections do always exist, they are not unique. Is T skew symmetric or not? Sorry? Is T skew symmetric or not? T, uh, yes, it is a totally skew uh, form. This can be proven. So it's tensorial and uh, totally skewed. If uh, d g is zero and uh, torsion d is zero, then d is called a Levitschita generalized connection. But Caveat is it's not unique in general. Okay, but nevertheless, uh, we can use this connection to define curvature, and, th and that's a good idea. Uh, so you can define a curvature. I think it is probably now six uh, chapter or so. Um, okay, perhaps before I introduce the curvature, I uh, should uh, describe. 
uh, the space of Levi Civita generous connections in the uh, Lie group setting. So, um, okay, so we have here the space of, of left invariant Levi Civita generous connections. Over over Lie group the G, and the result is that this is a um, an, this is an affine space. In fact, this affine space can be even after a choice of an origin and identified with finite dimensional vector space. Space of um, Levi Civita generalized with left invariant connections. Invariant. And D is an affine space space modeled on the first generalized prolongation of a special orthogonal group. S O E, where E is sum, sum of G and G star, the algebraic school. Uh, and here we take the first uh, generalized prolongation, which is the kernel of the natural map from E star, and so S O E to um, wedge three of E star. So it's just summing over cyclic. Uh, permutations and so the kernel of that map is exactly this first generous convention and this is uh, non-trivial so for the special orthogonal group you all know that the uniqueness of levi chivita connection is due to the vanishing of the first prolongation of so n but here we don't have the first prolongation we have the first generalized prolongation and this is not zero and this means that it's not unique and this is exactly the space uh, which parameterizes this and this space uh, is the sum of two subspaces sigma plus and um, Sigma minus, which are the kernels of the restrictions of all of, of this to E plus, so E plus and uh, E minus, so E minus, where E plus minus are the eigen spaces of the involution G end. Uh, and uh, so we know exactly what the space is. And, and uh, the most important thing is, of course, that it's not empty, so that you can find one element uh, there, and then all of them can be described. Uh, in this way, and the particular elements, so in some sense, the canonical Levi Civita connection on the Lie group is the following. So, um, canonical element is um, uh, obtained from the three. So, we have a three form, in fact, which we can call a B. It's this bracket H, and then here again the scalar product. Uh, so it turns out that this is a uh, uh, this uh, B. Uh, uh, so we consider this uh, this tensor uh, B, and from it uh, we can uh, define this uh, D zero. So remember that we are on the Lie algebra, so we act only on left invariant uh, sections, and so everything will be finite dimensional. And uh, this B can be described as follows. So it's a Result. So D0 is one third of this B restricted to the third B0 power of E plus, plus one third of B restricted to the third power of E minus, and plus um, a B uh, restricted to E plus tensor under two. Uh, e minus plus B restricted to E minus and so under two E plus. So from uh, certain uh, restrictions of this um, three form, uh, by making exactly this combination, we uh, obtain a torsion-free and metric uh, generalized connection. And then any others obtained by adding a tensor S from this first generalized prolongation to uh, D zero. 
Okay, so this means we know exactly what this space is of all the uh, possibilities, and uh, this allows, for instance, to study uh, uh, when you define some properties like curvature and so on, you can study how this may change and the change of the connection. Okay. And so now I speak about, I want to speak about the curvature. Also, a curvature of a generalized Givichivita connections. So, first of all, for a generalized um, connection without any assumption, you can consider the, as usual, the operator RUV uh, defined as the second. Uh, derivative. So when you apply this on some W, expect here's a second derivative minus D in direction of the bracket of uh, U and W. Uh, this is a different second order differential operator a priori. And it turns out that it's not tensorial. So you cannot consider this as a good um, tensor, uh, it's a good curvature like. Uh, quantity, but uh, there are some projections of this or some restrictions which turn out to be tensorial. So this is explained very nicely in the paper by uh, Mario. Uh, so in particular, you can um, so if we assume now that uh, the connection is metric, and then uh, you can consider the following uh, restrictions called R D plus uh, or minus. I explained, for instance, this R D plus. So this is obtained by restricting this object to sections of T. So this would be an element, if we like, would be an element of T M plus star tensor T M minus star tensor S O T M plus. Yes, to mention that this is. Yeah. Totally due to Marco Valtieri in his paper. Okay, thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much for bringing some summary. Thank you very much. So I, I apologize for any confusion there. So I've learned this by reading a paper by uh, uh, Mario. And so I, so, sorry for, for that. Really? So, okay, so this is um, uh, this, this uh, uh, known uh, result due to Marco Valtieri. So you have this type of curvature. And similarly, you can do this for minus. Uh, here and then by taking the trace uh, in this first argument, uh, you obtain Ricci like uh, operators, Ricci D uh, plus minus. So this is the trace of this R dot. Yeah, so it will be traced in this argument. So if we evaluate this on UV, this is let me just do this for plus, and you have here U. V and you can take the trace of this operator and this is a Ricci like um, uh, curvature tensor so this Ricci class will be then in uh, T minus star tensor T and plus star and similarly you can minus uh, of course, you have to take care which arguments you have to put there. Minus. Okay. And so these, these are the curvature tensors uh, which we want to consider. This is the G, uh, tensor. But still, the question is in the air whether this depends on the choice of the uh, generalized uh, connection. And in fact, uh, it does. Uh, it does depend, but only in a very mild uh, way. This was found out by Marco Batieri also that you have to fix the divergence. No, it wasn't. It was, <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is now yours. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, thanks for. Yeah, it's great to have all these uh, famous people in the same conference so they can immediately <laughs> tell you who proved what. Okay, so if we fix uh, divergence, uh, then we can make this um, independent. So I think this is theorem. So now I think I, I got it right after your help. 
Gabriel Fernandez. So the, this Ricci curvature, which was just defined. In fact, I can take the sum of these two and it will be a single Ricci tensor defined on which could be a symmetric linear form on the generalized tangent bundle. So this uh, called Ricci D. And I can compare it for two different Levi Civita connections. And the claim is that this is equal if you want to uh, the Chivita with the same divergence operator. Same. I just write with the same divergence. And this divergence for delta D, and so delta D um, applied to some section uh, is defined as the trace of D uh, of the section. That's the definition. Or the of the generalized tangent bundle. So this is very important that uh, although there are many connect generalized connections, uh, there's only one uh, Ricci curvature if you are ready to fix the divergence uh, operator. And in the Lie group uh, setting, we prove that any uh, divergence can be uh, fixed, and you will always find a Levi Civita connection with that divergence and with the space of all those can be also described uh, very easily. So Levi Civita generalized connection to fixed divergence. Position so for all delta divergences. So in fact, in the Lie group setting, this would be just a one form on uh, E equal to G plus G star. So for every delta in uh, E star, uh, there exists a delta generalized connection at E such that the divergence of that generalized connection is equal to delta. And uh, we prove this in the following way. We first check that for this canonical uh, Levi Civita connection on the Lie group, the divergence is zero. Uh, and then we have just to check that by adding some element of the first generalized prolongation, we can obtain all other divergences. And this is just a subjectivity of a certain linear map, which can be easily checked. And in fact, this is true in dimensions larger or equal to two. So, so here I need to assume, um, so we are in the Lie group. The G in group dimension G larger or equal to two in dimension one is false. Um, but do you need the then it, part of it? Sorry, is it about manifold? Or is it really, really no, no, it's a, I, I'm I'm specializing all to uh, Lie groups because that's the case which will be uh, re relevant. So I'm on a Lie group. I assume that dimension is at least uh, two, uh, and then the claim is that I can. For every choice of divergence, no matter what you want to choose, there's always a Levi Civita connection with that divergence. And that one is obtained by adding a certain tensor to this D0, and D0 is a Levi Civita connection without divergence. So that's, uh, that's the claim. Okay, and then we have uh, formulas for the curv rigid curvature on the Lie group, the generalized rigid curvature. Uh, which we use then to solve the Einstein equations. Yeah, I think this is general, right? For dimension, like for any manifold with dimension bigger than. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so this all works in this uh, left invariant um, setting, but you can also study this more generally on manifolds. Okay, so probably ninth or so will be now the uh, formulas for the uh, curvature uh, on the Lie group. So Ricci, uh, Ricci curvature formulas. In fact, we have formulas for the full uh, curvature, but we can write also Ricci curvature. This is the only part which interests us on a Group. Yeah, for a generalized metric 
left invariant generalized to the Riemannian metric uh, on a Lie group G. Okay, and so we have some a theorem which gives uh, such formulas. In fact, we have an invariant formulation without any uh, components and uh, um, formulation in components, which is useful using an adapted uh, basis. But I'm not sure I have much time for the adapted uh, basis. I could explain it here, perhaps. So you have this uh, Lie algebra G, and in particular, we have the metric, the pseudo Riemannian metric on the Lie group G. This means that you can already choose an orthonormal basis in the Lie algebra. Uh, this we may call the A, and in this is run from one to N, and the dimension of the D algebra. And then from this, you can consider uh, VA plus G. VA, this is a basis EA of the space E plus. Uh, but you can also consider E uh, N plus A, which is VA minus uh, GVA, and this gives another basis EI. Uh, I from n plus one to two n, and this is the basis of e minus. And in total, what you have is that you have a basis of the space E, which we call E capital A, and A runs now from one to two n. The basis of the space E, which was the sum of the Lie algebra plus its dual. And uh, so using such type of uh, orthonormal, this is an orthonormal basis. So D A E B is uh, delta, so is epsilon uh, A delta A B. Well, the epsilons are just plus minus uh, one, and of course they are related uh, with the epsilons you obtain here from the orthonormal basis in the Lie algebra G. So it's not necessarily positive. Uh, definite and the, the index form of the uh, Ricci curvature for divergence delta is uh, of this sort. So you have R I A and similar for A I, they are not equal in general if delta is not zero and you have the formula of this type. So you use the coefficients of this tensor uh, B, which is just the bracket. B is the tensor on the Lie algebra, which corresponds to the, to the current uh, the bracket. And um, uh, you can take here I uh, A, uh, and now A, A plus B I A C delta C. So you have such type of nice formulas. It's a quadratic expression. So Einstein's summation is assumed. Uh, and the range of indices is like here. So uh, indices A, B, C run from one to N and indices I, J, K run from N plus one to two N. So if you respect this range of indices, then uh, this is uh, a simple form of the uh, formula. You can also write it without any indices in an invariant uh, form, but it's a little bit uh, longer the invariant form. Uh, this is the explicit um, component uh, expression, which you can use then to solve the uh, Einstein equations on a, a Lie group. And to do this, you have you need also to express this B in terms of the uh, Lie group structure, the three form, and the metric. The metric is already implemented because uh, we choose orthonormal basis, so you can forget about the metric. Uh, it's already implemented here, epsilon, and so on. Uh, so you need only to express this, uh, these B's uh, for all such indices A, B, C uh, in terms of the three form and the structure constants of the Lie algebra. And th this we do. So I spare you the formulas. So there are four formulas for different uh, ranges of indices in, in such an adapted basis. And uh, so it's always the sum of some term, uh, which is the three form, uh, plus the sum of three terms which involve the um, the D bracket, so the structure constants of the D bracket, with different signs. So the signs are a bit tricky, uh, and uh, this, this gives you the explicit uh, form. So you can write this all explicitly in terms of the structure constants uh, and the three form and the components of the three form. And then uh, study the um, Einstein equation, generalized Einstein equation, which would be Ricci delta uh, equal to zero. 
So this means this zero and this also zero. And uh, we do this and solve uh, these equations and find all solutions uh, on all three dimensional uh, Lie algebras. And the proof, it doesn't go by the way that you use the classification of the Lie algebras and then look for each algebra what solutions you have. It's not like this. But we start from the equations, and the equations tell us the solutions, and it will tell us the structure constants of the Lie algebra. So it tells us everything in the, in the end. And now, in the remaining time, I would like to uh, explain what is the result of the classification in three dimensions. Okay, so this is the method. So you see, it, it builds on all the work uh, done previously by uh, several people who are here and people who are not here. And we will just specialize it to the left invariant setting, derive this very uh, simple uh, formulas, and then we just solve, solve it. And in fact, surprisingly, although there are many cases, um, it can be also solved with our computer help. So I think if you go up in dimension, then probably the system, algebraic system of these quadratic equations may be more and more complicated. And then you may uh, have to resort to computer help if you want classifications in low dimensions. But in three dimensions, we didn't use any uh, computer. So it was really doable by hand. And so the classification uh, is uh, systematized in a certain way. In fact, we have uh, two main uh, discriminants in the analysis. This is the classification of dimensions. Okay, so of uh, left invariant generalized Einstein matrix on three dimensional groups. So um, we consider first the two cases whether delta is zero or not zero. Of course, delta equals zero is simpler because it will kill uh, this part of the equations and it's just purely uh, this homogeneous quadratic part. Uh, and then in each of these cases, we distinguish according to whether the Lie algebra is unimodular or not. It turns out that the unimodularity is an important property. This unimodularity is related also to this um, divergence in some uh, various ways. And so this is a rough uh, structure. So we start with, um, uh, say, a delta uh, equal to zero and a unimodular. And so here I, I summarize the result in words because time is um, almost up. So uh, here we find that every uh, unimodular uh, Lie algebra has a generalized. You still have eight minutes. I have? I still have eight minutes. We started. Perfect. Minutes okay, then I can slow down a little bit. So we have the um, uh, result that for every unimodular uh, Lie algebra, we have a, a Einstein uh, left invariant generalized structure with delta equal to zero. And, uh, it, and I can list all the cases, but I think that would take uh, too long. But the upshot is that. For all these cases, the underlying metric is just a constant curvature metric, irrespective of whether it's positive or indefinite. The metric, you always get a constant uh, curvature metric. The classical the, metric, you mean? The classical, this, uh, classical underlying uh, metric. And the three form is um, in many cases zero, but not in all cases. In fact, for the simple groups, SO3 and SO2, comma one, it's not zero. Uh, and uh, yeah, so they, the metric is not flat in those cases but it has a non-trivial uh, three-form. So that's what we obtain uh, for delta equals zero in the unimodular case. For delta uh, different from zero in the unimodular uh, case, uh, we find that all of these um, uh, the algebras, all unimodular the algebras have also solutions with delta different from zero. And so we find more, uh, more uh, um, possibilities and in fact, it's rather interesting. Uh, there are several interesting objects which appear uh, here in the classification. One of these objects in the unimodular setting is the symmetric operator L, which encodes the Lie bracket. And it is an important tool in the classification to consider all uh, normal forms for this symmetric operator. And in fact, there are uh, infinitely many such normal forms because they depend on parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, and so on. And there's a fifth 
four multiplies only on one. Can you say again what is L? So L is the uh, operator, it's the symmetric operator related to the bracket, to the Lie bracket. Say, so, yeah, okay, so now U, V are vectors in the Lie algebra now. Uh, then we have the, uh, in this three dimensional Lie algebra, you can write the bracket as some operator L applied to the cross product. So this is an idea uh, which goes back to Milner, mm -hmm. who studied positive lift invariant metrics, Riemannian metric, positive definite on, uh, on groups and in particular on three dimensional uh, groups. And uh, he used this symmetric uh, operator in, uh, in a similar way as we use it, only that in our case, there are many normal forms in the Riemannian setting, all such operators are diagonalizable by an orthonormal basis. So only the first normal form appears in our setting. A priori, we have all five uh, families of normal forms. So these are three by three matrices, uh, which include these parameters. And you have to study which of them can correspond to solutions of the Einstein equations. And it turns out that not all are allowed, uh, but if you put, switch on the delta, Delta is allowed to be non-zero. There are more normal forms which are allowed than in the case delta equal to zero. So all, all unimodular Lie algebras occur, but not all normal forms of these operators occur. So there's a uh, there's a restriction, and in the end, the solutions depend on not so many parameters. They are all fully explicit, and uh, there are very nice uh, special cases. Uh, and uh, this is for the unimodular uh, setting, and for non-unimodular. Uh, Non-unimodular. Um, here we, we see that it makes a big difference whether delta is zero or not. Zero. If uh, we consider non-unimodular uh, algebra with delta equal to uh, zero, then uh, the algebra, the Lie algebra, uh, is uh, fixed up to isomorphism. So there's only one. Uh, the algebra which allows this. So only this algebra has uh, Einstein divergence free Einstein structures. Um, so only this non unimodular algebra has divergence free uh, left invariant Einstein. Uh, structures effects so it's a one parameter family of such structures which is fully explicit uh, so this is perhaps a surprising that here there's only one case which appears but for delta different from zero there are many uh, there are many cases and they can be all uh, classified and the main discriminant here to classify this is whether the uh, unimodular kernel so the kernel of the trace form when we take the trace of the adjoint representation that's a, it defines an ideal in the Lie algebra whether the metric on that ideal is degenerate or non-degenerate. So there are, if I call this ideal, I don't know, U, so this mean modular uh, ideal, uh, then uh, we can consider first the case where this is non-degenerate, uh, and then the case where it's degenerate, and they, are, they have very different uh, properties. So for instance, in this uh, non-degenerate case, there appears again this kind of algebra with A of this form, but there's also, okay, so we have this, but also you can take A equal one lambda zero zero lambda between uh, minus one and one. And in this case, the uh, three form is non zero. That's a solution with h uh, different from zero uh, on every such algebra. In fact, it's a family uh, depending on several parameters on, on these uh, Lie algebras. And in the degenerate case, the h is automatically zero. So the free form vanishes in that uh, case. Uh, but there are more algebras, uh, which are, yeah, in some sense, there are not only these algebras allowed, but uh, one more. So here, the case is that. A has a real, so this is not allowed for this case, but the, these algebras are allowed. And in addition, there's one more, and they can be described by the property that A has real eigenvalues. 
where the X is also matrix, which is not diagonalizable and has real uh, eigenvalues, a double eigenvalue, unipotent uh, matrix. And, th and this covers all um, cases. So, of course, this can be displayed nicely in a table with all solutions and the different properties, whether they, yeah. Whether the metric is positive or indefinite, whether it's definite in the modular kernel or not. So this is all, it's all studied in detail in our paper. And so we find explicitly all the solutions. Yeah. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, no, please. Uh, so we have like families of parameters, I understand, right? So yes. you're getting metrics, families of metrics that are Ricci flats and they depend on so. Yes. And this is also after taking the quotient by the algebra automorphisms. No, I think, uh, yeah, I think they will remain um, in this um, like infinite, infinite families, yeah. but uh, this is a problem which needs to be studied case by case. So now you can fix each algebra and for each algebra consider the action of the automorphism group of the algebra on the space of solutions. And this will give you the answer to your question, how many real effective uh, right. parameters we have, but it's already clear from, I, I mean, we write all the solutions and there you can see already. Uh, it's like my, my memory is that if yeah. one, just in the usual case, if one wants to study the deformation of Ricci matrix, like it's, it's a bit nasty because the, 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 the parameter space is the same thing as the obstruction space or something like that. Yeah, but I think it's not uh, not so hard because each of these algebras is I mean, it's just a three dimensional right. algebra. You can study the automorphism group for each case, and uh, then uh, consider its action. And so it will be classification of orbits uh, on this uh, space of solutions. And you're not getting singular spaces or anything. You're getting just uh, no. I mean, may, they may be uh, of course orbits of different dimensions. That's absolutely uh, okay. And uh, so the question would be how to parameterize the orbit space. So if you want to really separate them into isomorphism classes of the algebras together with a generalized metric, then you have to do this work, but we didn't do it. Because, I mean, this is this would be, this would have probably doubled the size of the paper for each case you start studying all this. Yeah, it's a lot of things. But it can be done for each case. If you're interested in one of these algebras, this can be easily done. And another thing was the current bracket, when you start doing left invariant things, the current bracket on P plus D star just becomes a, a D algebra bracket, right? Right, exactly. So like how, how much of this could be done if you just say, let's consider this other D algebra instead. Yeah, and, and but it's a very special kind. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, this is, in fact, these kind of algebras are very similar to another type, uh, which we encounter when we study symplectic uh, leaguets. Uh, so if you study symplectic E group, one particular case is to study the cotangent uh, bundle group of a Lie group. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, we find uh, several nice uh, type of uh, structures. For instance, you may ask, when is the canonical symplectic form on the cotangent bundle uh, left invariant with respect to some group structure on the cotangent bundle? And there are some possibilities because you are not obliged just to take a G plus G star, just a semi-direct product with a quadrant representation. You can also add some co-cycle. And uh, here we have the three form in some sense in the role of this co-cycle. So we have the quadrant representation, but then we have uh, also extended this by the, uh, by the three form. And I think uh, probably it would not be a good idea to just say, okay, consider uh, six dimensional Lie groups and look uh, directly for uh, some structure there. In that case, we would first need to implement all these very, very special kind of structure which we have on the six dimension mm -hmm. so we didn't do it uh, that way but i think that this is a good approach probably if you want to have some general properties in all dimensions to analyze this but then i think you would probably not be able to get a full classification it's a bit complicated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. can you carry out this uh, for uh, symmetric spaces and actually also uh, for complex groups to look for generalized scalar uh, metrics. Yeah, so general scalar is on our list of to do uh, mm -hmm. with Liana David. So with Liana David, we are working now in, in generalized uh, scalar geometry. In particular, we are also studying the structures uh, introduced by Roberto Rubio, this odd uh, exact covalent algebra. So you can study general scalar structures there. And so we have now paper in preparation. And we also plan to study left invariant uh, such structures on groups. And then this machinery will. Uh, can be applied. 
for the symmetric spaces? No, no okay, symmetric spaces in more general. I'm speaking now about uh, Lie Complex. groups with generalized scalar, uh, definitely generalized scalar structure. For symmetric spaces, this would mean you have to study the problem for homogeneous space, so G mod K, where the stabilized is no longer um, trivial. And this, I think people have started uh, doing this, uh, but with a different uh, approach. For instance, Fabio Podesta and Raffaello, they have some recent paper now where, where they study this bismuth, uh, Ricci flat uh, matrix uh, on homo compact homogeneous uh, spaces. So this is a related um, topic. In fact, I can explain what is the relation. So here we left the divergence data arbitrary, and we find all solutions for all data. But you could say, okay, no, I'm. I don't want this, I'm too lazy or whatever. I just take the Riemannian divergence because starting from the Riemannian metric on the base of the Riemannian metric, there's a way to define a particular divergence. And this is called the Riemannian divergence. So you find it in the book by Mario and Jeff, some discussion of this. And we can also do this uh, uh, here. So fix the divergence by this uh, property. And in fact, from our classification, we obtain also a classification of left invariant solutions uh, of Einstein equations with this fixed uh, Riemannian divergence so the theorem where all the solutions are uh, listed. So you could work in this more special setting. So not consider arbitrary divergence, but fix it in some uh, way and then study the homogeneous case G mod uh, K. So I think this way it can all be done. You would need to generalize these type of formulas in the setting where we have a non-trivial stabilizer no problem or oh, that's the theory of homogeneous spaces you can extend this generalized uh, geometry but i mean it's still complicated classification problem for instance homogeneous scalar einstein generalized scalar einstein that's a really difficult problem uh, so i'm just wondering about some maybe very special cases so let's yeah. say if you take su2 su2 what yes. happens for su2 there you have a riemannian uh, solution uh, with h different from uh, zero. I think it is was described already. How many parameters though do you have left? Uh, no, I think there would be no, not, uh, I think uh, only there's only one parameter, which is the scale of this free form. So the free form in three dimensions, one dimensional space, uh, and uh, you can uh, scale this, but I think this probably can be absorbed because uh, you can, we have some scaling uh, property on the metric. So if you scale simultaneously the metric and the three form, uh, and then uh, you can, and also the divergence, you, uh, I, so you, 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 you should sense these solutions come in uh, one parameter families. You can rescale at the same time the metric, the free form, and the divergence, but with different weights. And doing this, I think you can absorb this free parameter. So up to this freedom, uh, this is scaling freedom. What about delta though? No, the delta uh, in that case is zero. Uh, I was speaking about the unimodular, we are in this uh, unimodular case with delta uh, equal to zero. Okay, for delta different from zero, uh, I, can, I can look this up in our paper if we have some uh, uh, on SO3. Uh, so for in this case, I know that it's practically only one case up to scale. Okay. And for data uh, different from zero, I can look it up. Perhaps David knows this uh, no, I hard. I, know. I, I mean, I can look it up um, if you like. But there are different data. But, but there easy. are other solutions for the delta non zero. Sure. Uh, sure, yes, because I said that for every unimodular uh, Lie algebra, there are solutions with delta equals zero and solutions with delta different from zero. Yes, so definitely there are, there are solutions with delta. Different from zero, and I believe that even for SO3, uh, they have you have parameters delta because only uh, I think probably it's only half of the data yeah, is zero. Fix it, I think, on one yeah. of the two uh, eigen models. Okay, but then what, yeah. what I would wonder is what happens when you let delta go to zero? What happens to the solution that you have on SU2? Yeah, it collapses to one solution. I mean, they will all collapse to, to one solution. solution. So this piece we would reach the to the main variant. Uh, yeah. So the delta non-zero are not bi-invariant, but the one with delta is equal to zero, that's bi-invariant. Yes, that's even bi-invariant, uh, yes. because the, the three form is just a Catan three form. Does the Einstein condition actually applies to consider Ritchie flat? 
Uh, yeah, the problem is that in this setting, uh, we have no scalar curvature. We have only Ricci curvature. So the, the, you cannot take a trace of Ricci because they, this Ricci lives in E plus tensor E minus, if you like, or T and plus tensor T and minus, plus T and minus tensor T and plus, and there's no trace there. We have different spaces. So there's no Ricci trace, which could allow to define scalar curvature. So if yeah, you want to introduce I mean, scalar curvature here, you need consider, another method. You could consider Ricci equals to Proportional to the generalized metric function. Uh, yeah, but uh, generalized uh, metric, but in, this is inconsistent because a generalized metric uh, has uh, E plus and E minus orthogonal to each other. And this li lives exactly in E plus and E minus plus E minus plus. So it would again this is just mean that which is zero. <laughs> okay. uh, just yeah. going back to Marco's question, uh, in the beginning, you picked this special splitting, which was given by the metric. And that kind of fixes age, right? So, so now age is not a cohomology class anymore. Yeah. It is really specific closed three form. So you should have more freedom than just uh, a unique Markov three form, right? You can change it by a close. Uh, yeah, but element. here we are in this space one dimensional in this setting. The space of three forms is one dimensional. Oh, right. so three, three, yeah. three manifold. Yes, yeah. sorry. Yes. I think when you start going to four dimensions, then you will have right. more freedom. But three dimensions, it's just one parameter. Please. Uh, the rich flatness condition for the generalized metric does produce to a, a condition on the on the rich curvature of the three dimensional multivariate. Yeah, it's, it's related. Uh, yeah, it's related to rich curvature of the underlying uh, metric. In fact, if you consider a special case where the three form is zero and uh, delta is zero, uh, then it would be a rich soliton equation. So you have this rich delta. It's just uh, can be related to rich on the base plus the covariant derivative of the one form and this one form is in fact the place form so it will be in fact the solutions will be special uh, gradient uh, Ricci soliton so if you have a simply connected manifold and these are uh, certain gradient uh, Ricci solitons okay. if, if you consider h equals zero and uh, delta equals zero i think the general case you can of course talk, look what, which components depend on the Ricci curvature of the base but there will be other stuff three form forms uh, will appear there. So such formulas have been derived in, uh, in general uh, setting with certain fixes and uh, divergence and uh, data by dynamics or just streets with book to find how to write uh, the generalized Ricci tensor in terms of Ricci tensor of the dismute uh, connection plus some term which depends on the divergence. Uh, operator it can be done, of course, with left in very simple. I think it would be ni nice, so contacting to your work to study the supergravity uh, equations in that, in that language. Yes. So, that was the direction of uh, the question. Yeah. So, yes, one quick question. So, you study this in arbitrary signature, right? So yes. For Riemannian also. So yes. Of course, most of the solutions are Lorentzian. The Riemannian setting, for, I think, as I mentioned, for, for the unimodular uh, case, uh, I mean, these are not, not very new spaces. You have the uh, flat manifolds, which were classified by Milner, even the, uh, those non abelian groups which exist. So these are meta abelian uh, groups and the structures are well known. Then you have the constant curvature spaces with non trivial. Three form, uh, so there's not much more in the, in the Riemannian, in the Riemannian uh, word. But uh, here, uh, with, if you allow non unimodular and delta different from zero, you have many more possibilities, also Riemannian ones, but most of them are Lorentzian. So I think that might be interesting for general relativity and models generalized relativity. And yeah. is there, do you think of whether it's possible to define sectional curvature? In general geometry, so for terms of classification, uh, sectional curvature. Of course, in three dimensions, we didn't need the sectional curvature because Ricci and sectional would be equivalent. Um, no, sectional curvature can we define? Um, Uh, of, of course, you should then try to do this in this tensorial part. Uh, yeah, I think, um, and then we had um, 
uh, plus. No, I think um, it would be difficult because uh, what which planes would you um, consider if you take plus and uh, minus it will give zero because and this curvature tensor has values in SO of E plus or SO E minus so this part would be uh, zero so I don't see um, an obvious way to define sectional curvature also scalar curvature I don't see it of course it would be very very nice to have some way to define scalar curvature in terms of generalized uh, connections to have some alternative approach to this general scalar, uh, scalar well, curvature. There, general scalar. There, are, there are some notions already, like, like this weather. Um, no, but I, mean, I think this all in the general scalar settings, I understand. You see no, 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 map approach, no. You can see the remaining. Yeah. Uh, and is this related to considering two uh, Weizenberg formula? So the uh, term in Weizenberg formula when you consider two distance of class type oh, yeah, operator, I guess. Yeah, I guess so compared true. Dirac to. Yeah. Okay, so I think I have seen something of that sort in uh, physicists' um, uh, work, but um, uh, so so you say. What is the reference, Jeff? Jeff? Or, or, or no, Pablo Severa and Pablo Severa, Bala, and oh, also we okay. wrote something in the okay, on, so, on the book. And you, you too. Okay, okay, so I should have a look. Yeah, but there are. I mean, there are some. It's not general. There are some constraints for. But is it defined in terms of a generalized uh, Levi-Civita? Connect. So you if I give you a general Levi-Civita connection, can you define the scalar curvature? Yeah, we assume a spin that they, in, the, in, a spin. in the paper by Pavel okay. and Fritz, I think it's called. Yeah. So using spin or using uh, spin or no, we, we don't use the spinner. We can just take the generalized metric and the divergence. And a divergence. And, and a di and a divergence. No, I think that's uh, that's okay. And okay. So what's your name? Uh, uh, Friedrich. Friedrich. Okay. Okay. So I sh should have a lo look at this. Okay. Okay, so there are no further questions. Let's thank you. Thank you.